over the next 15 minutes, what I'll do is share with you what has emerged from some of this uh, background preparatory work that Romy mentioned that I've been doing for the agribusiness work stream and look at what are maybe some of the implications for this in terms of moving forward in the, the work of the global donor platform. What I'll share here has come from talking with a range of platform members, reviewing what's emerging as quite a large amount of literature, looking at a whole bunch of websites and also attending some events such as the Grow Africa Investment Forum and the Beam Exchange Conference as well, of course, as quite a bit of my own background in this, in this area. As Rami mentioned, this has all been documented in the background working paper. So essentially, uh, I'll go through a little bit what's the case for inclusive agribusiness, share a little bit around what are some of the emerging issues and opportunities, and then look at the implications for both donors and the global donor platform for rural development. I guess we should start with what do we actually mean by inclusive agribusiness? And of course, this links to the much broader discussion that's happening about at the moment about inclusive business in general or the broader discussion around inclusive economies. But essentially we're talking about a profitable commercial agricultural food sector venture that's designed to really benefit poor producers and consumers. I think we need to see this as a bigger view. It's not just purely about working with companies, but it's about how the whole market sector operates in a commercial way that engages with the private sector. And of course underneath this is always the attention for a triple bottom line of people, planet, and profit. I think what everybody will be aware is there's quite a number of overlapping concepts at the moment as I've illustrated here. On one hand we've got the idea of inclusive agribusiness that we're talking about but you also have agricultural market systems work, the making markets work for the poor approach and of course there's a very long history of much happening in the sustainable agricultural value chains. I think what I'm seeing is different people using different language very often to mean the same thing. But there's also perhaps some important differences around these uh, three areas that I've identified here. I think the value chain work has more of a focus on going from one end of the value chain to the other and, and value chain coordination. The inclusive agribusiness has a particular focus on how do you make inclusiveness work for businesses and what's the role of business in these areas. And the agricultural market systems has been looking a little bit broader at whole market systems with a very strong focus on making markets work, work for the poor. But of course, a lot of overlapping ideas here. And this is all linked quite strongly to other discussions happening in the uh, donor programs around private sector engagement, aid for trade, and also the idea of working at the bottom of the pyramid. In practice, um, what we're talking about is the inclusion of small scale farmers and entrepreneurs on beneficial terms into various sorts of markets and value chains. We're talking about creating supportive business environments for small and medium sized enterprises. We're not only talking about the big end of town in this. I mean also employment on fair conditions. So I think the whole inclusive agribusiness agenda is not just about small scale farmers but about employment opportunities along the value chain. It takes you into discussions about how you get viable agri-food clusters or agri-centres on a geographic basis. There's also discussions around how you can provide healthy and affordable accessible food products, so much more the service side of this. And there's important questions about how poorer and more marginalised groups uh, end up with a voice in the governance and investment in the agriculture sector. I won't spend a huge amount of time on, on the case for this, but I mean, I think we all need to be aware that agriculture really does still matter. We have very high employment rates in agriculture, uh, rural economies, uh, driving rural economies has a link to balancing urban migration, creating rural wealth. Agriculture can be a very important distributor of wealth. It's very critical around women's economic empowerment, particularly with the feminisation of, of agriculture. And agriculture still plays a really important place in the export income of many countries um, and there's also a few extra dollars in the you know how a poorer households um, pocket can make a very big difference in terms of getting the next generation uh, out of agriculture if you like into a better economic circumstances so there's really really important reasons why from a broader inclusive business inclusive economy agenda one should be looking very closely at the agriculture sector and I think what we're seeing is that agriculture has enormous potentials to deliver a lot of public goods through engagement with business activity and public-private partnerships. 
One might also want to ask why focus on inclusive agribusiness and not just stick with perhaps the more traditional uh, value chain terminology. And I think there's a number of things here that are worth looking at and that I've been engaging with people as I've been talking about this work. I mean, firstly is the fact that it links to this wider and rapidly growing field of inclusive business and inclusive economies more, more generally. I think it also recognises that a huge amount that's happening in the agriculture sector will be very heavily influenced by what happens in business. So understanding how you work, how you partner with business, how you create the right incentives for business to engage in an inclusive way is a very critical discussion. Uh, hence putting partnering and engaging with business quite, quite central. It also takes us beyond just a single value chain. And of course, there's a lot of discussion that in terms of overall rural economic development or household wealth, you get into trouble if you focus only on one value chain rather than looking at how a whole number of value chains link together. And um, it raises a, a more explicit agenda around creating diverse economic opportunities um, through uh, business activity engaging with poorer communities and poorer groups. So perhaps there's a few key messages that I can give up front and then go into a little bit more detail as we as we move along. So I think the first thing to recognise is that there is an enormous amount happening in this space with a pretty high level of uh, public commitment to the, to the agenda. Um, there's a very diverse range of donor programs and mechanisms supporting inclusive agribusiness. Quite how you might do the analysis of how much is probably a little bit difficult, but a back of the envelope assessment, I reckon we're probably dealing with three or four billion at least. That's without any of the private sector investment. So that would just be public sector investment. Uh, there are many, many different positive examples indicating sort of effective business and government and NGO partnerships. Uh, however, what one realises quite quickly is there's been relatively little synthesis of the evidence across all of these different examples, uh, which makes it hard to get the big picture about how much this really is leading to scale, how deep the benefits are, whether the whole idea about having a win-win for both business and tackling poverty is really working on a significant scale. And pretty much everybody in this space is talking about the need to find ways of having impact at a, at a greater scale, which takes you fairly quickly into fairly big questions about how do you link public and private agendas how do you mobilise raw resources? How do you look at financing to achieve, achieve things at scale? And I think the whole emerging thinking around innovative development financing becomes pretty critical in here, particularly looking at how you might think about managing risk in the agriculture sector, which is often one of the big constraints uh, to getting the investment that's needed in this space. The next picture is uh, maybe a little bit hard to read here, but you can see that if you go on to uh, the web at the link here, you can blow it up and look at all of this a bit larger. And what I've tried to do here is to just map out the huge range of things that are going on. So on one hand, you can look at a whole range of different company programs where they've been quite explicit about taking uh, an inclusive and sustainable approaches to the way they manage their value, value chains. Uh, we're seeing a whole bunch of responsible investment pr principles that are starting to underpin the way this work is, is happening. There's a series of business platforms that have been established, whether it's the World Economic Forum with its Grow Africa and Grow Asia, whether it's the Sustainable Agriculture Initiative platform, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and so on. Um, if you look at the NGO world, there's a huge range of different programs and initiatives with all sorts of ways of engaging with the private sector and engaging in this, this space. Linked to this, you then find a number of practitioner networks that have been set up. Some of these practitioner networks are more focused on the idea of making markets work for the poor and inclusive business in general, while other ones are quite focused specifically on the agriculture sector. And at the moment, there's relatively weak links between all of these networks, although there is a gradual emerging discussion around how there could perhaps be uh, better, better linkages there. Quite a number of uh, foundations are involved in this space. And there's a whole lot starting to happen in the, in the financing space, whether it's through IFC, um, the new EU AgriFi initiative, uh, groups like um, Root Capital, uh, quite a lot happening also in inclusive, uh, sorry, the impact investing space. So again, a lot happening around the financing side. And I could go on through uh, all, all these different areas. 
where there are sort of linkages, but the big question is there doesn't seem to be necessarily a huge amount of coordination across all of these different initiatives, particularly when you realise that from a donor side, these initiatives are often funded variously from agriculture, uh, the financing side of development, the trade side of uh, development, or the private sector engagement side. I mentioned what you can find if you look on the websites of a range of um, larger global companies, and uh, there's just a few examples here of the, the sorts of things that you'll, you'll see on their, their websites. But I think again to emphasise here that if we're talking inclusive agribusiness, it's not simply just about the larger global agribusinesses, although they set an important context, it's also about how do you look at small, medium scale enterprises, regional businesses, national businesses engaging in this space, and that's certainly where some of the challenges arise. Over the last few years, uh, Grow Africa and Grow Asia have got quite ahead of steam, and they've been fairly influential in bringing together leading uh, agriculture ministers, heads of state to their various uh, events and forums in Asia and Africa. And that's led to an interesting discussion from the government side about how a more enabling environment for inclusive agribusiness could be created. And a number of different donors are behind supporting the Grow Africa and Grow Asia and World Economic Forum New Vision for Agriculture initiatives. I mentioned the challenge of, of going to scale, which I think still lies behind a lot of this, and I think we shouldn't be ignoring some sort of pretty fundamental perennial issues, if you like, of getting investment of going to scale in the agriculture sector. So whether this is infrastructure, uh, rural services, finance, land tenure, women's empowerment, uh, social protection linkages into how that links with agriculture or just the broader enabling policy, all of these things are still pretty challenging, which basically brings you back to the idea that you can't look at just business alone. You need to look at the ways business is linking into a wider policy programming in environment. And I think that's also the discussions that came out pretty clearly during the recent Grow, Agri uh, Grow Africa Investment Forum. There's also a lot of discussion emerging about where do you focus for real poverty impact? So is it in the in, informal economy? Is it in um, domestic markets and regional markets? Uh, is it with cash crops or is it with um, staple crops? How does that link with global business? So certainly one of the emerging areas for an important discussion into the future is how these different areas link together, uh, how they overlap, and where you should really be focusing to have the maximum impact if you're coming at this from a, a poverty perspective. Let me shift on a little bit to perhaps where some of the criticisms can also be around the inclusive agribusiness agenda. And I've picked up here the theme that was raised by Oxfam when they looked at Grow Africa, and they sort of referred to some of the things they saw there as perhaps a moral hazard in the sense that there were questions about whether there was space being opened up for more exploitive issues, not necessarily giving enough attention to land tenure issues and so on. And while there are very different views about whether that's fair or not, or how correct it is, or how well based the evidence on which these points are raised, I think it does need bring us to looking at a number of different aspects that are important from the legitimacy of all of this work from both a donor perspective and also from a, a business perspective. So you know, making sure that in, the inclusive agribusiness agenda isn't creating sort of a veil for, for unintentional exploitation that a whole range of different stakeholders in this space do have a voice and it's just not the, the larger um, players that have the voice. Making sure that we're moving towards um, the sort of fundamental changes that are needed in the agri-food sector to achieve sustainability and, and inclusion. Be careful that we're not just slipping into purely technical responses where many of the issues clearly do have a, a, a political, policy, institutional domain. There's always the argument that perhaps these approaches are co-opting uh, NGOs to being less critical than they should. There's the argument about whether development effort is maybe going too far up the economic pyramid rather than helping those that uh, really need the help. You now, and can all of this in some places create a, a false sense that business can do everything and, and be an excuse for state inaction? So, you know, to have legitimacy in moving forward and to drive the sort of investment that's probably needed that does need from both the business side and the government side to be some answers to these sort of potential risks or, or moral hazards. 
and avoiding these things really I think has got a huge amount to do with unpacking more substantially where does the public and private good and benefits lie, understanding that dynamic. It's also very much about having a longer term vision for the structural change in small scale agriculture and how that transformation might happen. Investing in transparency and accountability right across the board, of course, is absolutely essential, which brings you back to the importance of good monitoring and evaluation and having some sort of synthesis. Um, looking at where you can get state investment to push down the economic pyramid so it's not only benefiting the already better off. Ensuring that there still is a strong civil society voice in this. And I think quite critically, making sure that the various multi-stakeholder processes that have been set up around of this really are inclusive, they really are talking about the deeper issues, they really are giving a voice to the diversity of people that have a perspective on these, these sorts of issues. So I guess this gives you a sense that there are some you know, fairly significant ways you can avoid some of the risks and some of the challenges that may be emerging. If we're moving forward to, to thinking about the alignment of public investment, public goods, and how you get the investment into the space and what needs to change. I think there's sort of four big areas to look at. Uh, you know, first at the top, I mean, clearly, if you don't get the smallholder and partner capability, the technical capability in the organizational capability, you don't get very far. But that then needs to be underpinned by the right sort of finance and risk management strategies. As I've been talking about, the enabling policy and infrastructure. And then, of course, looking much more closely at what are the business incentives and, and commitment, because if, if all of this is not commercially viable for business, it just isn't going to happen, which re brings you back to the link between that and creating the enabling policy, uh, enabling environment. So out of all of that, where do we get to with some emerging issues for donors? Uh, I think the first thing is the need to be able to demonstrate really clear poverty impact by working with markets and private sector. And while we've got a pretty good sense that you know, a lot of good stuff is potentially happening and the logic of it all makes sense, bringing all that evidence together to really be able to demonstrate that more substantially from what I can see is still fairly uh, thin on the ground, so to speak. For a lot of donors, there's quite some challenges in developing funding mechanisms that enable, if you like, an entrepreneurial programming approach that can actually effectively partner with the private sector. So I think a lot of the donors I talk to, that's always a bit of a challenge and a bit of a dilemma, whether it just comes down to sort of basic contracting uh, procedures. But working through some of those challenges to be able to work more effectively with the private sector is critical. There's some really uh, deep questions starting to emerge about given limited resources, what is the most catalytic way to use those limited resources? And you know, is that putting it into infrastructure? Is it underwriting risk? Is it working with private sector or working with others? So um, given the experience we've developed to date, what then would seem to be the most useful, the best ways to, uh, to use limited resources in the, in the future to be more catalytic? Ensuring responsible private sector partnerships and, and really making sure that when you're working with a part with the private sector in partnership that you've got additionality. In other words, that they're actually doing things they wouldn't have done without that partnership and you can really demonstrate that, that very clearly for accountability reasons. And finally, there's, a, there's an awful lot to learn in this space and I think the collective knowledge and learning network that can drive all of this and drive effectiveness across inclusive business and innovation and it's essentially a big boost to, to underpin the sort of innovation and next stage of development. So some recommendations uh, out of all of this. I think from what I've heard and talked with people, there is certainly a very good case for the global donor platform to proceed with an inclusive agribusiness work stream. Uh, but particularly doing that in a way that links across the trade, private sector engagement and market development spaces, but with a particular focus on the challenges for the agri-food sector. I think an enormous amount could be done at the moment by a better coordinated funding approach working um, on impact assessment, research, knowledge synthesis across donors. There's not very much cross-program evaluation and there's not very much synthesis of the lessons and the impact assessment to give you this bigger picture about the, the overall changes that, that are happening. I think the platform could really encourage a whole range of knowledge institutions and practitioner networks to work in a closer, more integrated way perhaps in some sort of global learning alliance. And I think all of this could be driven by holding a uh, workshop to essentially develop a stronger knowledge and learning agenda, whether that happens sort of towards the end of this year or early next year. So I think that gives some fairly clear directions for the sorts of things that the global donor platform could be encouraging at, at this point in time, given all of these issues that are 
emerging and, of course, the, the significant opportunities in this space. Um, here, I won't go through this in detail now, but there are a, a range of different uh, topics and, and areas that could be looked at in terms of a knowledge and learning agenda. In terms of the role of the donor platform, this comes back very much to its new strategic plan and the key focus on brokering knowledge, on supporting an active network within the donor members, um, and being able to host key conferences and teleconferences on some of the key emerging issues. Perhaps to finish off then, I think there's also three topics that could be a, a strong focus initially in terms of taking the work stream the next step. First one is what I've been spending quite some time talking about, which is developing the evidence and knowledge base. The second one is around innovative finance for inclusive agribusiness. I think there's tremendous interest in this area, some big challenges and the, the real recognition that somehow more finance needs to be brought into the sector makes this uh, a high priority topic. And finally, I think the enabling policy environment, and this takes us back to the critical role of working with national governments around these issues to better understand what can be done at the national level to get better dialogue between the business community and the policy environment in country uh, and to take forward perhaps some new ways of thinking about what that uh, supportive environment would, would look like. And certainly this was an issue that was raised a lot in both the Grow Africa and Grow Asia forums that have been held over the last 12 months. So I think that brings me to the, to the end of that. Um, and you know, more detail on all of this, of course, can be found in the background document.